Hello, my name is Michael Carell, and I'm here to discuss my paper, Terra Terra Bozu Defensive Rain Cloud Plots. Uh, this title needs a little bit of explanation, so I will very briefly just say that rain cloud plots are these sort of hybrid plots for univariate data where we combine multiple visual forms that show the data at different levels of resolution. So what I mean by defensive here is that by combining these visual elements together, we get an idea that we're not being fooled or tricked or missing any important distributional features, right? Like I can see that this distribution is roughly normal. There's no outliers, no clear missing data in these things uh, by these components working together. Uh, and then this last component, Teru Teru Bozu, refers to these little doll-like charms that in Japan are often hung in windows to try to ward off the rain. Uh, and the reason I'm making this illusion is because I often feel like with distributional information, people just think any old visualization will do. Uh, and I wanna talk about how they're not necessarily magic, right? Not just any form of visualization will provide these defensive capabilities that we're looking for. So in particular, when people are talking about visualization, often Enscombe's quartet is mentioned. So here we have four series. They all have roughly identical summary statistics down to two decimal places. And what you're supposed to do is say, aha, if we visualize these four series as scatter plots, immediately you can see the visual differences between these two. Like some of these are linear, some of these are nonlinear uh, data series. However, it's just as possible to generate what I call anti-Anscombe's or visualizations that look identical, but hide important information. So here I have two scatter plots. Uh, and on the left, if you plot the trend line, it looks almost flat. And on the right, if you plot the trend line, it goes upward. Uh, and the reason for this is because on the left visualization, there are only four points, but on the right visualization, there are 204 points, uh, but they're all over plotted in the same location, uh, which moves the trend line up in a way that is not visually obvious unless you know what's going on. So that's what I mean by the fact that not just anything will work. Visualizations aren't magic. So in particular, if you have, say, a distribution of size, um, often the guidance is, okay, you want to visualize that. And so the common way of visualizing a univariate distribution is often with a box plot. Um, yeah, there could be lots of data that's hidden in this box plot. So imagine this is, you know, size of dogs, right? Some dogs like chihuahuas are very small. Some dogs like Great Danes are very large. But then in the general, most of the stuff is in the middle. And so maybe it looks like a Gaussian like this. Um, but it could also be cats, right? So you have house cats that are very small, and then you have uh, great cats like lions and tigers that are very large. Um, they would generate the same box plot because the box plot only cares about those core tiles. Um, so that's a problem. You have this visualization that purports to show you something interesting in the distribution, uh, and yet it doesn't. And so often the reaction to that is, okay, we'll just always show the raw values like I'm doing here. I have the raw values for all the cats. Um, but then you have another issue, right? So here I have, uh, imagine this is my performance in a class and showing me all of my grades and my final grade is just an average of these things. Um, if I get higher than a 70, I pass. Did I pass this course or not? Um, that requires you to do a little bit of visual estimation. Um, and in particular, in this case, it appears, you know, 68%, I just barely didn't pass. Um, but I'd argue that's something that's very difficult to recover from the visualization per se. Per se. You have to do a visual estimate. So that creates these kind of two classes of problems, right? So if you visualize the aggregate data like we did in the box plot, sure, it's concise, it's very precise, um, but there's this ambiguity in this fact you might be missing something. Uh, whereas you visualize the raw values, uh, now we have scale issues. We have a bunch of individual points we need to visualize. Um, and we also have to create only these visual estimates of these statistics of interest, right? I can't directly see the mean and median from the raw values. I have to reconstruct it visually. And maybe that works and maybe that doesn't. So what Alan et al. proposed is a rain cloud plot, right? If both of these approaches to raw values and aggregates have their problem, why not just combine them, right? So in this case, instead of por qué los nos dos, um, three elements. So the three elements of a rain cloud plot uh, is one is what I'm calling the cloud, which is some visualization that provides information about the overall shape of the distribution. Uh, so here I have a histogram. Um, you could also have rain, right, which is the visualization of the raw values. So here I have this dot plot showing raw values. And then lastly, sort of this catch-all term I came up with is lightning, which are parts of the rain cloud that communicate derive statistics, inferential values, pretty much anything you're not going to be getting from those uh, categories or that you need in sufficient precision. So that generates the final rain cloud plot, cloud, rain, and lightning together. Um, so Martin Lambrex calls rain clouds xenographics. 
point as a weird but sometimes useful chart. Uh, and he presents this canonical form, I think, of the rain cloud, uh, which is a box plot, is our lightning, our jittered data. And in this case, there's a, a y-axis and they're assigned random values to help with overplotting. And then this split half violin, which I'll be calling a density plot. Um, but I want to point out that although this is somewhat the, the canonical form, there are other forms of rain clouds as well. Right. So Christian Hill, uh, Hill here is presenting what I think of as like a meta rain cloud plot. It's literally showing uh, the days of rain in two uh, areas of uh, Great Britain. Um, and here they've changed the jittered dot plot into this sort of stacked uh, dot variation. Um, you can also augment the rain cloud plot. So here from, from Micah Allen, uh, they've combined these to show group differences in means. They have this slope plot that connects the elements of the rain cloud together. Um, and you can also mess with the individual components. Um, so here, John Schwabisch was recreating a rain cloud plot in Excel um, and uses a half split box plot instead of a split violin plot to show the overall shape distribution. Um, or you can even do weirder things. So here, Cedric uh, Scherer, instead of showing the raw values directly, has an aggregate in this sort of heat map form. Okay, that naturally leads, I think, to, to two questions, right? So if you can mess around and swap out the components of these rain cloud plots, well, what does that full design space look like? Uh, and then the second, and perhaps most pressing, is, well, do these things actually work? Do they provide these defensive capabilities that we want? Um, so the first question is a little bit easier to answer, so I will deal with that first. Um, so I looked at sort of what is the design space for these things. I, I go into the details of design more in the paper, um, but really there's kind of one design decision here, whether you have a density plot or these split half box plots or any things like that, um, which is how are we going to approximate the shape of the distribution? And to me, there's sort of two strategies that you go through here. Um, so one is continuous, right? You have these continuous estimators often driven by things like kernel density estimates um, or discretized ones, right? So a box plot is, you know, discretizing the distribution down to three numbers or so, uh, but you could also have a histogram or these quantile dot plots on the bottom that also discretize the shape of the distribution. Similarly, with rain, these plots of the raw values, um, you have lots of particular designs. You have these strip plots and dot plots. And, and to me, the issue is how to deal with scale or overplot. Right? You start having so many points that you can't guarantee they're not gonna overplot each other. And as we saw with our anti enscombe that can lead to issues recovering density information. So one is just to not care about it, right? So in the strip plot here, um, literally just let the points overplot and if they overplot, it's fine. Um, the second one is to use this jittering approach, which I just discussed earlier. You have this random Y axis that just gives the points more space to live. Uh, and this last one maybe most interesting is packing the points together. So here maybe we're giving up a little bit of distributional fidelity um, to get those points uh, as close together as possible. Um, you even have these sort of hybrid approaches, like on the bottom, we have Stephen Few's wheat plot, uh, which bends these dots together um, to provide exact traditional fidelity at the cost of maybe compactness of the design. Uh, and last, I'll discuss very briefly is lightning, right? So there's just any sort of statistics you want to throw on top that are not going to be recovered by the other two uh, forms of the visualization. And so there's just what statistics to show. Uh, and so here it's a you know, question of you can very, very simply show mean through, for instance, an individual marker. Um, you can start going into the realm of inferential or predictive values by showing things like a confidence interval or predictive interval. Um, or you can throw the kitchen sink at the problem. So from Potter et al., these are moment plots, right, which show you mean, median, quantiles, but also things like skew and kurtosis. So really the world is your oyster there. Right, and so if you think of a ring cloud plot as just grabbing bits from this design space, you know, you can generate something like a canonical rain cloud plot here, but you can also generate a design, uh, and I call this one in the paper, the oops all circles design, right? So here we have three very visually similar encodings that all show the same distribution at different levels of, of fidelity. Um, so I want you to keep this standard box plot and this particular data set in mind. This is life expectancy by, by country uh, as we go through the next part uh, to answer the research question of, well, do they work? So already we can maybe build some intuitions here that different components of these rain clouds do different things. So for instance, here I can see maybe a mean value uh, through my lightning in the center that I couldn't recover very easily from the other components. And there's some things that sort of uniquely uh, appear in only particular components of the rain cloud. For instance, this is life expectancy data. It's all in integers. You might not have known that from the histogram or from the mean, but it's something I can recover in this particular rain cloud. Um, might be harder to recover in something like this, right? So here I'm using a B-swarm plot, 
we're unpacking those points together. And so the notion that these are actually integer data, which uh, becomes very clear in the strip plot here, is, is less clear here. Um, this particular design I also want to bring up because I think it's an example of things not reinforcing each other well. Right. So I think if you look at, in this case, the heat map, um, you see, okay, you know, there's a, a mode here and then a long tail to the left. But I'd argue that's exactly what you see in the mid graph plot as well, right? Like it's not, you know, start getting a little bored of this data by the time you get to the lightning. Um, and even the beast one, right? It maybe shows you the scale of the data in the way that the others two don't. Um, but the overall shape is, is pretty much the same between all these things. All right. So that's one intuition is that not all of these components work together well in the way that others do. Um, but a more formal way that we're investigating the rain clouds for the purpose of this paper is relying on a formalism I call algebraic visualization design proposed by Kendallman and Scheidegger. Um, and the general idea is you have data um, and you have data representations and you have data operations and design operations to be able to do visualization. And we want stuff to commute. Um, maybe an intuition to build here is that um, if there are big visual changes in your ultimate visualization, that should only happen uh, if there are big changes in the underlying data and vice versa. So just to show you a really brief working example of how you could use this diagram, I'm just bringing up our cats and dogs from earlier. Um, as we go from unimodal dog world to bimodal cat world, that's a big change in the data. And so we would expect a big change in the visualization as well. And yet we do not see that. So that's an example of sort of a failure of commutation, which suggests maybe we shouldn't be using box plots. So I don't have time to go into all of the algebraic failures we discuss in the paper, uh, but I do want to highlight a couple. Um, so the first, which is very particular to uh, rain cloud plots, is renormalization bias, which is um, something that happens when we have to deal with scale causing us to renormalize all of the visual uh, components of the chart. Right. So as an example, I, I have this data set here. I've added 10 points. Um, somewhere to the, the left right, of, of the mode. Um, and that creates some visual change, but not a ton, right? Like, okay, like my histogram went up a little bit higher there and you can see those 10 new points uh, in the chart. Um, but if I do the same sort of change and now I add it to the mode, to, so, so to the center of the chart, now we see a visually distinct rain cloud. Um, and that's because of this renormalization, like right? to fit all the points into the region under the chart, we have to change the size in the in the Wilkinson dot plot. Um, the histograms end up getting rebinned because they have to you know, split on the mode now. And so this creates this kind of visual change here that I would argue is you know, equivalently a big deal from one chart to another, but because of this uh, produces different outcomes. Um, the second algebraic issue is, is randomness, right? So I mentioned that jitter, uh, each point gets a random Y value. Um, this Y value doesn't communicate any data and I think makes it very difficult to disambiguate distributions. Um, so here I have 10 distributions that have been represented as a jittered dot plot. Two of them are exactly the same and the other eight are different samples from the same distribution. Can you find them? Uh, I think it's very difficult for you to do so. Um, it's, so these two visualizations happen to be the exact same data, but it's very difficult to tell because you have this very visually distracting signal of the jitter that doesn't actually mean anything. Um, whereas if I present the same data as a density plot, now maybe it becomes easier to say that, okay, these are all similar distributions, um, but these two are exactly the same. Last issue that I'll bring up is this notion of discretization, uh, which I touched on a little bit earlier. Um, so here I have two rain clouds of the exact, uh, they seem very visually uh, similar. Um, and in fact, the histograms are exactly the same and the box plots are exactly the same. Um, however, you can see in the dot plots on the bottom, there is a little bit of rebinning going on. Um, and this is because on the left, we have floating point data and I've rounded it to integers on the right. Um, that is arguably a big change in the data that I should deal with. Um, and yet it's difficult to see in the chart. Um, a different form of rain. So for instance, here I'm using a, a, a regular dot plot without any packing maybe you can start seeing it. So on the right, you see this regularity in the, in the location of those glyphs, but on the left, you can't see as well. Right. So those are examples of big and small data changes that maybe have big and small visual representations. Um, I think there's two lessons that you can draw from all of this. Uh, we talk about more in the paper. Um, but the first is this sort of standard rain cloud that I presented of this box plot with the jitter dots is maybe not ideal. 
Right. So one is that you've got this box plot as a central component, and that doesn't really capture some pretty important distributional features that are hard to recover otherwise. Uh, and then lastly, you have this jittering, which is very, very random and doesn't really bias much in terms of, of preventing overplotting. Um, so that's one lesson is maybe we should move away from the standard rain cloud into a different variety of rain cloud. Um, and then the second, however, to maybe undercut that is that mutual defense might be more important than trying to get each individual component correct. Right, so for instance, you know, here we have this data and sure the strip plot is totally overplotted, right? I have no idea how much density is in each of these locations, but that's fine, right? Because I can recover that density information elsewhere, right? I can get the mean value. I don't have to estimate it from the overplotted things um, from either of those two things. And I can get tailoredness from, from this density plot on top, right? So these components don't have to, you know, do everything all at once, they can work together in important ways. Right, and then maybe the last wrap up lesson, right, is that these rain clouds are not magic, right? You can't just throw a rain cloud or any other univariate uh, visualization next to your distribution and hope that everything's gonna work out, right? So one is that we've shown examples of where these statistically important things aren't corresponding to visual importance in the final design. Um, one thing that I didn't talk about very much in this talk for reasons of time is that all of these visualization techniques have important parameters, right? like the number of bins in your histogram, the kernel you use in your kernel density estimate um, that can produce different visual outputs. Right? And then lastly, there are these costs these incur. Right? So certainly they're more visually complex. Right? I'm showing you three things instead of one, uh, but there's also statistical complexity of how you communicate what these components are and how they interoperate. Right? Do you have to explain what skew or kurtosis is to your audience to get them to understand a, a chart? in a way that you wouldn't have to if you showed them a box plot, right? But I would conclude by saying, maybe you should still try them out. So in particular, they do seem to offer a benefit above an individual univariate visualization. And there's all, because these are not quite set in stone what the visual genre of a rain cloud plot looks like, we have lots of room to experiment with different designs, try different approaches, uh, run simulations and, and figure things out. In particular, if you would like to try them out, I have built a, an observable notebook here that lets you explore the full design space in the paper and run your own simulations to explore for different algebraic violations in your own rain clouds. And so with that, I will take questions.